So the title of this talk is uh, Civil Disobedience of Patients. Uh, two key things I think uh, that characterize our journey towards this point. And I'm going to um, start to talk about myself. I, uh, my name is Roy Willemsen. I live in Zwolle with my wife and three kids. And uh, in the beginning, I lived in Arnhem. Actually, that is how I came here. In the uh, years in between, I moved uh, there. I'm a, I'm a full stack developer uh, slash uh, designer. About 20 years experience in, uh, in software development. So there's an, uh, like a summary overview of uh, what I've been up to. So I started programming when I was about 18. Uh, I was studying, and uh, that was my Saturdays basically. So. And, uh, as a student, I didn't have to wait tables, so I could actually code. And in 2000, I got uh, uh, work, working professionally with Java. And my career went international, so I did a lot of work uh, in the United States and in Sweden and uh, places like that. So in 2003, in the end, I thought, well, maybe I can do this myself. So I decided to, to start my own company, which is uh, now, now 16 years ago. So I actually I did, I launched a company which uh, didn't work out, and uh, uh, fight with other founders is the usual stuff, basically. So then I decided, well, well let's, let's calm, calm down a little bit. I lived here, I met you know, someone who worked here, thought it sounded really interesting what they were doing here, so I uh, joined in as a full stack developer. In the meantime, I got married, had some children, did some other work on the side, launched some startups, and, uh, and now we're in 2019. And my current job is, is uh, I joined, actually, I joined the CRV, uh, became an employee and as an agile leader, which is basically, uh, think of a new way of looking at engineering management. So my job is basically just to create a new environment where teams can, uh, can uh, work effectively to make, make cool stuff. <coughs> so where I'm coming from is usually on the intersection of these things. So I like to, like to work there, it's something that I feel very comfortable in. And uh, one of my, uh, what fascinates me is just to, to, to tinker with the, the DNA and, and debug the corporate operating system, basically. So I've been doing that throughout the years, and at some point, uh, they gave me this opportunity to do this and join the leadership team. So what is this place? So our business is cattle improvement. Um, we've been around for a while, starting from a small corporation between partners who decided, well, uh, b better to, uh, it's better to do things together because uh, breeding uh, livestock is a complicated business. And uh, in, in the beginning, that uh, started by just selecting the best bulls and, and cows for breeding, and nowadays it's extremely data driven. So, um, to give you a quick quick idea of what it's like, it's like uh, you have a, a good cow, but he has uh, some poor traits, like a poor skeleton, and then you look, look for a bull who has strong. Uh, skeletal hereditary traits, and you pair those, and you can fix those kind of issues in the offspring of uh, of the cow. So basically, that's that's one of the uh, things we're breeding nowadays. Uh, in the past, you had to look at what the effect would be of a bull, uh, and look at all the offspring, and, and, and really will you look, uh, discover in that way what uh, kind of improvements the bull would give. To, to cows, and nowadays it's more like we look at the day in DNA and we can predict a lot of stuff from that. If you look at the place of CRV in society, so it's it's about the food chain, and uh, CRV is doing their part to the, the evolve yeah, the agricultural track, track related to uh, breeding cattle, and you could say. I think the Netherlands, um, may, maybe there are some people in the room who know a lot more about this than I do. But I think uh, the, the Netherlands has uh, a lot, a lot of noise about uh, cattle breeding and uh, making cows who do phenomenally well, produce lots and lots of milk, and, uh, and but the cow of the future still doesn't exist uh, yet. So that's also, we look at uh, the resource use it has to go down, energy use has to go down, production needs to go up. So, so there's a lot of stuff that CRV does in that area. And a lot of scientists who work, uh, work here, the people who have farms themselves, and uh, they have a lot of passion to, to get this right, to make this uh, right for the farmers and for the animals and also for the future needs of society. 
So throughout the years uh, we've grown, I'm not completely sure about these numbers. I've tried to get exact numbers, but they're quoted differently uh, here and there. Um, it gives it an idea about the size of the market. You're talking basically about millions of cows that we're, we're tracking. And uh, it's a complex domain, and not every country is, is the same. So, so globally, a few hundred people are in IT, and most of them are here. Today I'm focusing on this uh, on, on a much smaller part of CFE. So this is business unit data where uh, the bulk software engineering is done. And uh, our job is to collect massive amounts of data and make it useful for our customers. So this data and anything we can make of it are put back in the hands of our customers uh, and their advisors through many different interfaces. So originally it was paper and EDI, so XML and nowadays REST APIs, mobile apps web application. So if some type of interface was popular in the past 30 years, probably used it somewhere. Uh, we're organized in squads, loosely following the Spotify model. Currently we have nine squads with uh, about eight to 10 people each. Uh, and the chapters help us to keep the conversation going between people who do the same thing. So like a uh, front end or UX or ops. Typical squad is Product owner, scrum master, some UX, front end, back end, business and an analyst, and a test engineer. But also teams who are dedicated to back end who just take a domain such as um, milk or health and then go deep on that, produce APIs, and there's front end teams who will build on top of that. So the, the problem of being around for a while is that there's always legacy. So this is a uh, type of life. So we're always transitioning from one thing to another. And particularly in fast moving areas such as uh, DevOps or uh, front end. So we try to design for this. So to make it easy to master and easy to retire. So to get a look at this, uh, I think the core money makers were all uh, Cobalt and Fortran in the beginning, and they're still running. So what I decided to do today is to take you uh, on a small trip down to memory lane. I remember it. Memory is a strange thing, and I'm, I have a very selective memory. But uh, I'm going to pick out some highlights and just uh, tell the story of how we, how, where we started and what we, uh, how we got here today. So around the same time that Netflix came to the Netherlands, and, I, uh, and my late night coding sessions were replaced by late night binge watching, um, we started Scrum. And Team switch from a basically a traditional waterfall, waterfall way of working, where, uh, where basically uh, we got a spec from a designer and we had to build exactly that. So that, and design was about colors and fonts and, and not much more than that. And suddenly we were sitting together in rooms with people we were really not really familiar with. And at the time I was the only Java developer at CRV and I was responsible for, for a really tiny part of the portfolio. So there's a long list of products that we built and there was a small line that said, small web applications and that was the stuff that I did. Uh, part of that small line also was a, was a web shop who did uh, tens of millions of euros in, in revenue but still still hurts a little bit. But. So but being alone had some advantages so I was, uh, I was isolated technologically from what my colleagues were doing and uh, if you're working alone you can pick and choose the framework without being noticed. So uh, we picked uh, Grails for uh, some projects, and in the Scrum teams that started to get noticed because people were looking at what I was doing and they thought, like, hey, you can just work really fast, it looks nice. Uh, so that got me thinking that uh, there was an opportunity there to, to really educate my, my colleagues and see where, that, where we could go from there. And Grails was actually a great way to move into the Java ecosystem because we had this question, is Java is an interesting technology, but it was so far removed of what we were doing at the time that we didn't see people go grow into that role really quickly. But Rails was an excellent um, middle, middle ground because uh, of the, the rules it imposing on your design of your software. So I started this, we grew up to about 10 Rails Java developers. Uh, it was a company that we worked closely with first aid. Some people are here who helped uh, grow us to, to that level. And then until about half of the developers started using Rails also exposes to some, some uh, advanced ways of uh, test automation. So, at well, that time we were building WAR files on our local machines and we were uploading them to production Tomcats by hand. And 
And our agile coach who was uh, in our team uh, saw that and he was like, no, no, no. So he uh, put together a Jenkins environment uh, for us. And I remember the first time I looked at it and I was like, man, this software is ugly. Um, I'm not sure, it's a lot better nowadays. Brown probably remembers that moment. <laughs> yeah. So, but all the stuff that could be built by a Jenkins job uh, eventually was converted and leaving out a lot of legacy that uh, required lots of small steps and, and careful manual steps to get into production. And this was also uh, the beginning of a growing awareness of test automation. So we got a lot of TDD work uh, uh, starting. And we didn't really, I think the TDD religion never really took hold uh, uh, here, but test automation uh, surely did. And this is how I sold test automation to the product owners at the time. Because for them, the idea of writing automated tests sounded like it took it would take twice as long now to build software. So we really had to, to um, if you look at industry best practices, that works uh, for us, but they, uh, well, what we were starting to do test automation, we didn't tell them of course, but we needed the, the room in the project to do this. So um, what we had to do is basically take the time to explain why, so if you can drive a car without an oil light and it will work fine for a long time until it doesn't. So, and this gave, it gave us a little room just to, to start exploring uh, test automation uh, within our company. And now it's basically the normal thing to do. But because many other technologies that we're having uh, in production right now uh, don't lend themselves well to this uh, type of test automation, well, we started to see a sharp difference between uh, what we were doing and uh, the other projects. And it allowed us to ship to the production without downtime. And uh, well, we were trying not to brag too much about that, but uh, we, we felt really proud, and we, we felt that we were uh, moving in the right direction. Then, in 2015, we started a new ambitious, ambitious project called Helix, and the plan was to replace like a huge, huge chunk of monolithic uh, software with a modern equivalent. So this means microservices, REST APIs, distributed architecture, uh, totally new ways of, of, of uh, distributing your data, e event, events. It was a huge project. Uh, at its inception, we figured it would take hundreds of man years, and I still think that's a pretty, pretty accurate uh, assessment. So we, we did a lot of uh, change over. So from, we moved from Subversion to Git, from Tomcat to JBoss, uh, from Oracle to Postgres, which was a really big step. And new stuff is so included message queue, uh, Java VE. Uh, so from Grails, which was we felt really comfortable with, we, uh, we then took a step forward into Java VE. And of course, uh, configuration management, so Puppet and Vagrant running, com running the entire environment on the laptop, which led to other interesting uh, side note we had we need much, much more powerful laptops, so it's a separate story. <laughs> what was really sad that Docker at the time was in the will it run in production phase. So everybody was questioning, well, it's fun, but will it run in production? So we sort of skipped that and skipped to know that it's all uh, with OpenShift and stuff like that, it's all uh, more normal lab. We were quite aware that at the time we knew very little, so it was a sort of a joke So to say how hard can it be. Uh, so we tried to, to run towards the ignorance and, and, uh, and hoped that answers would come the, this way. And because of all the new things we did, we, we were able to leapfrog to modern ways of working again. So, but that also meant that we were beginners in a lot of things. So we started attacking all all the unknowns that we perceived, uh, lots of proof of concepts, uh, trying to get a walking skeleton situation to cover the entire stack, uh, but it didn't do any spectacular in the game. I think that the, one of the hardest parts was to learn to talk to each other, so we work within the limits because uh, of what we knew at the time. So getting new <laughs> vocabulary right was really, really tough. This is a, a picture, maybe some of you remember this, but. Uh, from the first, very first sprint review <coughs> of the project. And in the first two weeks, we uh, built from scratch uh, this thing. We launched 
an API without authentication uh, on OpenShift with a Postgres uh, back database, small client application on top of that, three scale API management in between. And then we have this, uh, this thing where it's our, our on premise Oracle database. We copied some data to a separate database and had this thing copying it to Postgres. And I'm not sure if you know the project uh, Golden Gate uh, from Oracle. So that was way too expensive. So we created a small shell script called Golden Bump. And basically, what I did made a connection to Oracle, did some selects, and did some, did some observing on, uh, on the Postgres uh, connection. And that way, we could pump for our prototype data to, uh, to the cloud environment. So this, this proves to us that the, the basics, the technological basics were in place. And then we had to figure out how to do this uh, other hard stuff. So we then um, all, all already, we were starting up look, of looking at Puppet, okay, using uh, configuration management just to, to spin up an environment here. And then we abandoned this. But then at some time we had all these uh, Postgres databases and our Oracle DBAs uh, were, were keeping their eyes on us. They were uh, traditionally they did all the schema changes for us. So we go to the DBA and said, well, we would like to have the, this field added to this table, and they would do it for us, and it would take a few days. Um, but this new way of working uh, with Postgres, uh, well, all these changes running through the DBA is really, uh, really blocking uh, for for uh, rolling out software quickly to production. So. Um, we found this tool, and it does automated schema evolutions. Basically, we have the schema definition of the database in our source code, in our, in our uh, source code, in our version control system. We build a specific build. When it launches, it just checks the version of the schema, and then it automatically updates it. So this, this, I think this is a fundamental uh, piece of technology that enabled us to really rapidly roll out software to, uh, to other environments. I think we take so from there. Some some pro, pro, uh, some developers just joined us in the after this point, <coughs> and they never knew how it went before that. So it's really interesting because um, uh, Papine has said to me, "Well, yeah, it seemed very logical to do it this way, but it never was <laughs> before that." So, so it's fun to hear. So in, time goes by. In 2016, we heard about pipeline as code. Uh, so normal or manual job configurations, and that was awesome because we had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs, and it was totally getting totally out of control. And we switched our more or less uh, trunk-based developers down to to GitFlow, and then used a multi-branch pipeline. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but uh, plug it to a build differently based on which type of branch you're on. So yeah, this is an example of of this. Big piece of Groovy script that's being run uh, on Jenkins, basically checking out what uh, branch you're on and choosing a different uh, build pipeline based on that. So I'm not sure. Is, is uh, are you familiar with uh, GitFlow? Is there people who never heard of it? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I'll skip this. The hard, the hard part. Is we had all these branches, and then we had we had to look at our infrastructure, and we, we have we had a fairly traditional DTAP environment, and then we were thinking, okay, what goes where? So the developer is your developer on the machine, so he gets he can do what he wants, uh, develop feature, release, hotfix, except for mask, perhaps that's strange. Maybe if you're solving a problem or something, then. Developer goes to tests, usually single node, and then features features were not uh, built, which was something we really like to do, but in a like a pre-container world, that was really difficult. So then we would love to do like an acceptance test on the feature branches, uh, for instance, which we did, but then the accept uh, people doing the accepting would have to come to us, and sit by our laptop, and uh, look at what we did before we merged the code uh, to develop. Then release and hotfix branches went to acceptance. And it's perhaps strange, but we thought, well, hotfixes don't happen very often. And if, and if it happens, it's so important that the, the release cycle has to wait for a little bit. And this, this enabled us just to, to leave out a separate environment for uh, hotfixes. And then going from master to production, we didn't, uh, we read all these blog posts. As 
what's real is each, each, the, the organization requirements of being able to do this all the way to production were pretty heavy. So everybody was cautioning us, so you have to get a really good testing in place. So we were unsure if we had that. So so we chose this, and the IT our IT department who had operational responsibility felt much more com comfortable with this style. So what we did is we built to our factory, then uh, we'll we would go into a formal change board process, and then they would launch, uh, they would push a button, which was a separate Jenkins uh, environment that did only this. So the bad part was, is there, was, there wasn't a staging environment. So IT had to sort of um, believe that we all <laughs> did our job <laughs> properly because it was the first time that that particular artifact was released to production in that particular way. So fortunately we didn't have uh, much issues, but this is a long-standing wish to, to have a separate staging environment so you can work to this. And then all these uh, developments around OpenShift started to come back and uh, new developments, OpenShift 4 came out, Docker came back in, into the picture. And from the teams, uh, the, there was this desire just to do something with this. And I don't want to go really in, in depth into the cloud computing, but what sort of struck me is that the impact of such a seemingly minor technological decision uh, has, a, has a huge impact on the organization. So from, as from a developer point of view, I thought like Amazon WS, getting something launched on there is not much different from getting a VPS from a local uh, hosting uh, provider is something that I did uh, very often. So what's the big deal? So but everything was different. Uh, yeah, I'm okay, in many ways better, and in some ways unclear. Uh, certain types of jobs certainly don't exist anymore, and many new skills are needed. And, and we also have like hundreds of servers uh, standing here in a bit uh, building, warming up the place. So we did our homework, uh, seeking partners, doing proof of concepts, and this is what we're moving towards now. So I would love to say that uh, we're moving uh, on the cloud, if speak, we're like, like a month away from doing that. <laughs> so it really, so would be really fun to, uh, to, to revisit this talk in a year from now, to see what happens. And, and then they all die, something like that. And, and this, so OpenShift, we, we did that before. Uh, Jenkins is something that we're really familiar with. Azure, Amazon, uh, it, technologically it didn't matter pretty much. Uh, you, you found in the end that Azure is a pretty good fit for our organization. So what I want to do now is just um, showcase some of the, the, the ideas we have moving towards. So one of those things is uh, source to image, and that's, uh, the thing of totally changing the way we build our stuff. I don't want to go in depth into SOI, but I have some links at the bottom and we can share some blog posts and posts that I found really uh, good explanations of this concept. And if you spend five minutes on it, you get uh, the gist. But I love these kinds of ideas because it's, it's a technological uh, uh, gimmick, but the idea behind it is that you build an artifact in an environment that is really close or identical to the production environment where it will ultimately run. And if you then look back at, at our singular pet Jenkins environment that is filled to the brim with uh, dependencies and workspaces and, and totally different versions of operating systems in Java, and, and that sort of, sort of starts to look like a bad idea. While it worked for us for years, but so, this is new, we're going to experiment with this in the coming uh, months, and uh, it's probably going to cause a lot of new problems, and hopefully, hopefully interesting ones. And then, since we're moving to OpenShift, uh, we're going to turn our Java EE applications to, into runnable ERs, the Spring Boot style, but then with Java EE, and then we will we'll no longer have JMOS EAP instances. But we're also looking at stuff like this. This is something that uh, a lot of engineers get really excited about. Uh, being resource <coughs> conscious in the cloud and reading about the, the capabilities of these things like really extremely fast startup times and uh, native uh, compilation and so So we're looking at that, we're playing with it. But for the moment, uh, 
prawn tail is the official the official route. What's also very interesting, looking at uh, testing, is is uh, we're going to do mocking and that sort of stuff completely different. Uh, what Arcurian Cube offers us is that you can start a container and inject all kinds of external services uh, so that the container believes it's actually in, in a production-like environment, but we can control the environment completely. So that's going to be uh, really interesting. And a final thing that we're really in excited about is uh, Istio and service meshes. And it sort of sits over, over your infrastructure in between everything. And what I really excited about is uh, stuff like this, like canary rollouts and circuit breakers. I mean, remember the first time I read about canary rollouts, I was like, this is a really great idea, but it was also re really hard to do. Couldn't figure out how to do it without Jenkins environments, with our specific infrastructure. So getting to this point where technology makes it super easy nowadays and uh, being able to well, work in an environment that allows us to play with these things is a lot of, is a lot of fun. So in summary, I, s I noticed that I've been running through my talk in like a, like a lightning speed. <laughs> um, continuous delivery is, is much more than constantly evolving uh, technology and ways of working. It is also a set of uh, beliefs that need to be carried broadly, not only in the heads of the engineers, but also in, uh, management needs to get this. And, and, uh, it's actually it's very similar with UX and, uh, and Agile or DevOps. It's all kinds of way of looking at this, uh, these types of problems. And organizations, especially large ones, uh, they need time to change. So nobody's going to ask us for more tools. They, they want delighted users, and, and part of that is better software faster. So if we, as, as developers, are aware of what the business uh, really needs, and we can frame these types of solutions in, from their perspective, then they start to get the value from these types of uh, solutions. And we can, we can get more freedom in implementing these, these things in our organizations. And also, once you take their perspective, you figure out that there's a lot more problems that you're not used to dealing with and you have to address. So I, I hope you found value in this talk and perhaps, perhaps it may help you move uh, move forward in your own organization. Thanks. <laughs> so we have a lot of time for questions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, um, there will be a lot of changes in your infrastructure. What will be the consequences for your uh, CD pipelines? Well, um, <coughs> I think it will be pretty much re-engineered from scratch. So um, our one, we have one team that's going to, to look at, uh, this is like a front-running team, is going to f figure out uh, a, a way of working, and then we're going to try to adopt that uh, in the other teams. But we're, we fully expect that everything we have right now is going to do to, to, uh, the toilet. <laughs> okay, then will you stick with Jenkins, or do you also yeah. keep the options open? Uh, well, basically the options are open, uh, but uh, Jenkins seems very well positioned in OpenShift. Uh, the, the plugins provided for OpenShift with source to image are really mature. So at, at the moment we, s we don't see a reason to move away from Jenkins, but we're not, we're not really uh, married to it. Mm -hmm. So for the Canary releases, uh, so we are looking into Istio as well, especially for that reason and all the other stuff that Istio gives. But you plan on using plain Istio or something on top of that because there's many tools that build on Istio to do this kind of. Yeah, thing. OpenShift has a uh, tool, uh, service meshes that basically builds on uh, Istio, so it it adds stuff to it to make it even e easier to use. So it's not plain uh, Istio. Yeah, but it's Istio with use of OpenShift. Yeah. Yeah, so what we decide to do, this is really uh, new. Azure decided to offer OpenShift as a service really recently. So, uh, and we were in the middle of selecting uh, a partner to, to launch uh, OpenShift on. So we were like, okay, uh, th this is great for us right now. So we're going to try OpenShift as a service and um, hopefully that allows us to, to focus on the, the top part of the solution and then 
we can move forward quickly instead of the, uh, have to figure out for ourselves how, how this entire stack and Kubernetes and everything below it has to work. So we, we can comfortably toy with the high concept stuff that OpenShift offers uh, turnkey. But Azure offers OpenShift as a service? Yep. Because I know that one of our departments is trying OpenShift on Azure and they couldn't get it stable. So uh, okay. I'm thinking of moving away. So we haven't get it, got it to, to run as of yet. The next month, it uh, would be very interesting to, to share our experiences of the next six, six months <laughs> at a later time. Uh, by then, we should be able uh, to show uh, new pipelines and uh, share some frustrations and uh, successes about this. But we're just at, at the start of the journey. <laughs> Who is managing your uh, databases in the cloud? Are the DevOps team doing that, doing that or do you still have separate EBA teams? Or? We do have a separate EBA team. Uh, they are also getting used to the DevOps uh, style way of working. So some of them are really closely um, working with uh, the squads. And we're, everybody has to, to learn how, how this works uh, going forward. So. We're looking at Postgres as a, as a service uh, for now, and we'll take our DBAs uh, with us, and uh, they they can figure out together with us how their role fits in the new situation. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be interesting. Yeah. But they are excited as well. So okay. they they uh, they like that we're, what we're going this way. This is this, this we had this like this major. Uh, Conflict, I've, this, this is a really hard word, but being an environment where Oracle rules everything and then you introduce a, a competing uh, database technology, it was a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. So, but over, over the years it has proven itself and then uh, they, it, 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 has a, it has its place in the organization. So we have this uh, Oracle and now we're moving, looking at moving away from Oracle as well. But there's a lot of business logic in PLSQL inside Oracle database, so we're not, yet, we're not able to get rid of it anytime soon. Yeah. So, so then do you have any plans for doing something like release management? So if you know if st things start happening because of you doing uh, a release of some kind of microservice, uh, that you can at least get some insights in that or trace back that. Uh, uh, well trace back errors to uh, being caused by a certain release? Or uh, how strict are you in that? I, I mean, at our time, we uh, let development teams just push out whenever they want, and if mm -hmm. something goes wrong, then they have to find out and roll back. Yeah. And it's sometimes very difficult to find out what caused exactly what. Yeah, so, so at the moment, we, uh, we use New Relic, we use uh, uh, Prometheus, uh, Grafana, we have all kinds of tools, uh, Kibana, all to capture what happens in, in the system and then if something goes wrong then we go <laughs> deep dive in, inside this uh, stuff and we expect that we have to, to rethink all of this moving uh, to Azure and OpenShift as a service. There's a lot of monitoring already provided by the platform so we're first going to look at how that uh, helps us uh, like debugging stuff like that and then if that's not enough then we have to look at that stuff like uh, you mentioned um, but that's not the first thing we're looking at right now. So we were kind of optimistic, which is kind of who, how, how we always are, but we, we, um, we think that if we got the monitoring uh, properly, then we can, um, yeah, we can work with that. Yeah. And a uh, small question, you said you want to move to OpenShift next month? Yeah. Is it a cool. big bang or is it one? No. Of the no, no. So uh, <coughs> basically, the account becomes available next month, uh -huh. and then we're going to work uh, work out the, which steps we're going to take. Uh, a lot of our teams have did uh, work before that, beforehand, with uh, prototype, OpenShift environments, just figuring out the big problems, uh, and then we have like a, a stage set up where um, the stuff that is farthest away from the customer moves first. And then uh, latency sensitive stuff is going to uh, going to uh, go last basically. So we really want to have 
we really take our time. Just we want to have it uh, deployed, running for a few weeks, weeks, make sure that it's it's, uh, it's performing properly. Uh, and then we have this hybrid situation, and some of the our uh, APIs are running here, and some of them are running over there. And and hopefully all that uh, as well. But big big bang, nobody is really glad about that. Uh, yeah. It was extensively discussed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people got angry. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. What? Uh, how did you convince the business to uh, yeah. execute this transition? What, what, what is the? I mean, as an engineer, uh, I think it's all great and, mm -hmm. and fine, but uh, well, you need someone to pay for it and. Uh, yeah. We need to convince the business that it's beneficial for them. What's the business case? Yeah, so actually, I think uh, this change had uh, champions in many different parts of the company. So, for instance, you have like, like managers who read literature and see where the world is going with this type of technology and who are open to hearing about it. Um, but also, there's the cost aspect. So, there, there was, uh, we, we had a consultant. Uh, basically make a big calculation about what our ser server cost would be and how much money we would save uh, going uh, towards the cloud. And that actually was the biggest uh, key to, 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 to express in terms of cost savings. But that was not our uh, motivation because we wanted to have this, this, uh, this, this freedom just to, to uh, scale Flexibly, um, have a clean environments, no longer pets, because we have a pet cattle discussion, uh, you, you probably know, and then we have like this sort of cattle, but secretly, like kind of pets anyway. So it's, it's really hard to get rid of this, this way of thinking, and, and you need uh, this, this type of technology really just rips it out of you. If you, you, you have no choice, they're, it's, they're, they're all uh, cattle. And so we were looking hoping that this technological shift would enable um, the freedom we were actually looking for. And then we were okay with that we couldn't get it right now. But it, the process is pretty difficult. Yeah, you have to find what is, what is the, the driver that actually helps someone to consider it and say yes to this. And, uh, and it's not only technologically. But you, you can, but what helps if you uh, don't talk about it, but actually show stuff. Because then it starts to, to click, and uh, we found out that uh, I, re I remember this is an idea that I wanted to do once, and I never did it, and I still regret it. But the Mesos Apache Mesos was kind of coming up, and as a as a as a as a tool to create a virtual server uh, distributed over many machines, and I, I had this idea: grab some old PC boxes and put them here on the floor, uh, like four of them or something run Apache meters of them and, and, just, and take one out with a sledgehammer or something. To, right. really, to really bring home that it still works. It's awesome, right? And then I looked at, uh, I did some experiments and I, and I noticed that it, it takes some time before it, the, the measles discovers that the node is no longer responding. And then for the demo, it was <laughs> not as powerful as I, as I imagined in my mind. But, but that sort of stuff really happens uh, um, sometimes. And, and that, it's really fun if you if you see someone who you think it's hard to convince, really being surprised and, and, and excited and uh, and really uh, helping you uh, uh, getting a step a step uh, further because they know the way in the difficult parts of the organization that we hardly ever see, and that's the, the world of budgets and stuff like that. Yeah. I think also that the company also really really helps uh, getting technology. Those rooms get to, to experiment and to come up with uh, new ideas. We have also now a uh, long bureaucratic architectural uh, uh, how to say it, uh, gateways to, to go through uh, for getting something accepted. And that's very great about uh, also the culture. Thing. So you can, as developer, you can come up with uh, a new uh, thing and give a presentation and uh, do a demo, show it. And, uh, yeah. I think it, it, it's, it's true and yeah. I, I think it, um, it took years to 
to really cultivate this culture. Because I think a lot of the room was already there, but we were not, we were not using it, so people thought it wasn't there. Yeah. And then some like courageous individuals said, well, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and then people weren't angry, and then and other people were like, oh, okay. <laughs> So th this sort of created this, this environment where experimentation is okay and, and, uh, and uh, sort of the civil disobedience part. It's like, if you think something is really important, don't wait until some, someone uh, tells you to do that. Just, just do, do it, and, but do it in a, in a way that uh, doesn't hurt the company. And then if you can get people excited about it or talking about it, then it can go a long way. And like I already said with Grails, that was just an instant where, where we decided, well, let's show this to someone and then it, it ex totally exploded and changed the way we develop software uh, in the end. Yeah, so you also don't know if, um, you don't have to carry it always further. Yeah, if you can convince a few people, they can help you uh, carry the idea forward in a different way. Yeah. All right, no more questions? Let's have a break. Let's have a break. Yeah.